Oh, uh, it I think around five hours or something. I can't remember exactly. But Sam and I, Sam went with us and he took turns and actually Lorena did a little driving too. So we were all kind of trading off. So it wasn't too bad. Yeah. Plans changed because we were supposed to go with the a couple their daughter was having a baby, and her husband was going to drive up there. They thought maybe she was having a pregnancy, so he ended up not going. So Sam and Marina and I got together. Her fingers were so small that I didn't see the baby. She didn't that day, but she did a couple days later. She's had it now. Anyway, so it, it worked out, but yeah, I didn't have to drive the whole thing myself, so that that helps. How are you, Tom? How are you doing? Good. Good. Yeah. Yep. Good day. Good day. Yeah. Good day.
Survey the Winter's Cross 118. <clears throat> 118. Thank you. 
Uh, do we have any praises so far this week? Uh, Matthew? Well, I guess my brother, he came out of his stroke state when he woke up. Okay. He can talk, but he's having trouble struggling with everything else. So he stones his prayers. Okay, Matthew's uh, brother came out of his stroke. He can talk, but some other things aren't, some other faculties still aren't there yet, so he still needs our prayers. Uh, Prudence. So, Gordon fell on Sunday and seemed fine. He said he was fine. Um, this morning when I got up with him, he said he, his ribs were hurting him bad and it hurt to breathe. So we took him to the emergency room. We sat up there for four and a half hours to find out. They did an x-ray and a CT scan and everything came out normal. So praise That's the Lord. Good. good for that, yeah. Uh, Norma. Yeah, Jerry, the, that procedure he had on Monday. He took a oh, for the uh, heart monitor thing? Yeah, for his atrium or whatever it was, uh, yeah. And feel okay. Well, that's good, good. Nothing but good news tonight. So far, huh? <laughs> um, any prayer requests that aren't on the list? Uh, Franklin's sister, mm -hmm. Darlene, lives up in Albany. She had uh, some real serious uh, health issues just recently, and she had to have some rehab in a spot or in a rehab place. And they discovered she had high, real high white count and she has to go to a specialist and find out what's causing that now. She was asking prayer for her. So. Okay, Franklin's sister Doralene had went to the hospital. She has a really high white blood cell count. Doralene was the prettiest girl in Summer Grade School. Summer Grade School? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Derek, you had your hand up. Um, Susie called, and uh, her oh. sister's um, dad shaved. Uh, they went to the Tokyo Hospital, and she's having some breathing problems. And they're going to have to fly her to some other hospital that has a room. She didn't say where that would be, but probably Portland. I'm guessing they didn't do any study. Anyway. Sure. Yeah, Charmaine Char 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 is having bleeding issues, and she was in the Coquille Hospital. They were doing transfusions, and they didn't have a room for her there, so they're going to have to put her someplace else. They're going to have to take her someplace else because there's no beds around here, apparently. So we'll need to remember Charmaine and Susie and Dick. Uh, somebody else had their hand up. Who was it? Erica, you had your hand up. <laughs> yeah, I was just going to say what he said. Oh, okay. <laughs> I was hoping you wouldn't remember. Uh, Lawrence, yes, sir. I have an announcement coming tomorrow at 12 40 because I have a hard time sleeping in that night. So, sleeping in the bed. There's not a lot of noise in your new apartment, no. is there? No. no. Okay. Barbara's not keeping you awake? <laughs> no. Okay. <laughs> My daughter, Maria, and I are going to be traveling up to Chicago School tomorrow. She has an appointment in the gym tomorrow afternoon. Okay, Lola and her daughter are going to be traveling tomorrow to Eugene. We'll need to pray for that. Anybody else before we go down our list? Okay, uh, Ted's still asking for prayers for getting a new group home. Uh, Vinny recovered from surgery. Uh, Susie, we already mentioned Charmaine. Uh, Max got health issues. Megan needs some prayers. Uh, Carrie's uh, Peter, friend Peter is moving here. Uh, Jerry's. Uh, he is here now. Oh, he is? Yes. He oh. Arrived. Oh, yes. okay. So Peter is here. He made it here. <laughs> uh, Jerry did have Jerry uh, did have a successful. Procedure today. Uh, Jack Singh is very sick. Uh, Dick's cancer surgery is tentatively scheduled for October, so we need to prayer on that. Uh, Steve is still traveling in, uh, in Alaska. 
So we need to pray for his safe return. I think he's coming back to Cleveland. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Uh, Lawrence needs to get his house sold. Um, Kendall wants to quit smoking. That's a toughie right there. That's a hard thing to do. Uh, Jacob's mom has a leg infection. Uh, Sandy is in hospice care. That's she passed away. Uh, oh, really? Sandy passed away? She passed away? Yes. Oh, okay. Who uh, is Sandy. Our daughter in law's <laughs> sister. Your daughter in law's sister. Janet's daughter in law's sister passed away. Uh, Doc Slider's not doing well. Jerry needs to find a caregiver. Um, we already had a, an update on Matthew's brother, Kurt, and he still needs our prayer. Uh, Marcy Smith lost her son. And Mary from Abandoned Church is in the hospital. Anybody else? And Sherry's making baby faces. <laughs> Okay, uh, Tom, we'll start our, our prayer meeting and I'll end it. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful to be here this evening. We're thankful for the many, many blessings you give us each and every day. And we just pray you'll continue to watch over and keep us, keep us safe. We do pray, Heavenly Father, for those not able to be with us, that you would be with each one and pray for healing, and comfort, and strength for each one. We do pray, Heavenly Father, you continue to guide and direct our lives that we might live a life that's pleasing to you. We thank you again for the church and the many, many blessings you give us each and every day. Pray this in Christ's name, amen.
Father in heaven, we are thankful that we can be here this evening, Lord. And we, thank you for, we thank you for your love, Father God. And we're thankful that we can come to you in prayer and that you hear our prayers, Lord, and you answer our prayers. We pray for Charmaine tonight, Lord, and we pray for the, we pray for the doctors that will be treating her, Lord, and we pray that they will find a solution to uh, what is wrong with her, Lord, and we pray for Dick and Susie as, as they deal with that, Lord. And, we pray for continued healing for, for Carrie and, and Bob and Lois. And you, 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 you've helped them so much already, Lord. And we ask that you continue to heal them and make them better and take their pain away, Lord. Um, and we ask your continued blessing upon this church and other Christian churches throughout this day. This we pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen. 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 Turn your Bibles to Romans chapter 5. Thank you for your word, and we thank you for this letter that Paul wrote to the Roman church, and we just ask that you would help us to learn from it tonight, and thank you for all the things we've discovered, and that we've uh, also just things that we've learned, but we need to just have a reminder. We just ask that you would um, teach us once again, we ask in Jesus' name, amen. Romans 5, verse 1. <clears throat> Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into his grace, in which we now stand. You're going to have to talk a little loud. Okay. Maybe, Tom, can you turn up a little bit? <clears throat> and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also rejoice in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character hope. And hope does not disappoint us because God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit, whom he has given us. You see, at just the right time when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man, though for a good man someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So he begins, therefore, since we've been justified through faith. Now remember, uh, justification is the, the act of God, it's a, it's a legal act of God, and it takes us uh, into the courtroom, and that's the picture, you know, behind the word, God is the judge, and uh, it's the act of God, this judge who declares us righteous, um, it's the 
verdict that he's passed is the act of God that he's declaring the sinner righteous. So he took our sin, he transfers our sin to the person of Jesus, and uh, he paid the price on the cross, and he takes Christ's righteousness, and he transfers that to our account. So he declares us righteous before God, and on the basis of the work of Jesus and what he did, we are justified. And uh, so we've been justified. He said he's already done it in Christ, and it's through faith because it's about you know trusting God's promise and trusting in the work that Christ did on the cross and then his overpowering of death, <coughs> rising from the dead. Um, and because we've been justified, something else happens. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So we were, we were his enemies. Uh, we were in rebellion against him, but Jesus' blood that was shed on the cross had brought that peace. It brought that reconciliation with him. So, you know, peace in one sense is Think of it in terms of, you know, the absence of conflict. But but uh, this kind of peace that the Bible talks about is it's more than that. It's, it's this wholeness that we have. It's the word shalom in Hebrew. It means wholeness. It means harmony with God. So Paul's saying that we have this, this harmony with God now. And the second thing that we have is access. Verse 2 says, through whom we have gain access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. So here God is saying we have, we have this access, we've been given access into his, you know, his royal presence. Uh, just like, you know, if um, most people wouldn't be able to go before a king or queen unless they were given access um, most people are denied access, um, or even with the president, you know, but you have to be granted access to be in, uh, be in their presence, to be, um, have an audience with the, the king or queen, but, but if we have this audience with God, he's granted us this access into the heavenlies, you know, into this place of grace, um, into his presence, and and Paul says, and this is where we now stand. We're giving the standing before him. So grace is the, the, the operating principle there. You know, it connects us with God. Um, God always works on behalf of his grace. We stand before God on the grounds of his grace. Everybody stands before God on the grounds of his grace. Um, so it's the way that he treats us, and it's also the way that we're supposed to treat others with grace. So we have access by faith uh, into this grace by which we stand, and then Paul says, and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. So joy ought to be, you know, a, a character quality in every Christian believer. Joy is the result of what God has done for us. And this word for joy, it's, it's not so much an internal joy, but it's uh, an expressed joy that kind of uh, bursts forth. So, you know, we, have, we can have joy inside and no one else can know that. <laughs> That's not this kind of joy. This is the kind of joy where you just can't sit down and you have to shout and scream and holler and you're excited. <laughs> it's an enthusiastic outburst. That's what's going on here. So, and what are we rejoicing in? Well, we're rejoicing in the hope that we have of the glory of God. And, uh, you know, hope is one of those words that the English word has kind of changed over time, but it's, um, we think of it in America more as wishful thinking. I hope I'm going to be able to do this or that. That's not the biblical word. The biblical word is an assurance. When you say hope, it means it's a sure thing. So we have hope in the promises of God. It's a certainty. It's a certainty about what he's done in the past, certainty about, 
what he's doing now, and it's a certainty about what he's doing in the future. We have the future glory uh, of God. One day we're going to see his glory, and we are going to share in that glory as well. We're going to receive glory. It's that, that song that we sing sometimes. Glory for me, glory for me. <laughs> That's what it's saying here. Um, in it, you know, it's not selfish because God wants us to have that glory. Remember when we talked about um, Daniel and uh, at the end of Daniel, he said, we're going to shine like the stars. And I think literally, we're just, because that's what God's glory is about, kind of this brilliance, you know, that it's almost blinding, <coughs> um, that we can't even see God right now because we die. But even when human beings look at angels who have been in the presence of God, you know, there's the brilliance. Um, and we're going to share in that glory. Um, so we will see his glory in our new bodies and we'll also share in that future glory so just we can be confident that he's promised us that you know that we can be a part of that and um, so god will be with us and um, we're going to see those things and then he's um so what he's saying all together here that this justification is done for us. It's giving us this new status before God. It's made us righteous. Um, it's given us this new relationship with God. We've been reconciled to Him. We have peace with God now. Um, all that hostility has been set aside because we've been reconciled. We have harmony. There's this wholeness that we have, uh, not only in our own lives, but with God. The sin has been removed. And we can stand in his grace and we have this future um, hope in the glory of God and in sharing in that glory um, Paul also goes on to say and this is the part that we don't like um, that we're gonna have to experience hard times too <laughs> so look at verse 3 not only so but we also rejoice in our suffering that's the part that we struggle with. Um, some might say, you know, what if hard times come? What if I can't hold on? What if I can't measure up? And Paul, you know, he's saying a couple things here in this passage. One, that you can count on hard times coming. They're going to come. And almost every book that we've studied says the same thing. I know we've been over this over and over, but I think it's something God wants us to get. Because it's almost every book, you know, that we think well on this suffering and that we should rejoice in it. And it's part of life. Rejoice in our sufferings. Um, and the word means afflictions. The basic, the basic meaning of this word is pressure. So we, we are experiencing a certain kind of a pressure. And uh, there's different kinds of pressure. There's the pressure of persecution that, that we're promised that will come if we're... Christians and living out the Christian life. Um, and that's one way in which this word is used. But there's also just the pressure of just daily life. Um, it might not have anything to do with persecution, but just living life. There's going to be pressures that come. And um, in Romans chapter 8, he's going to talk about, uh, he'll say that what shall separate us from the love of God shall trouble. Shall hardship, so shall persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword. So these kinds of pressures of these daily realities, they're part of the normal life that we're going to live. And um, some of these pressures come from our own weaknesses, from our own fallenness. Uh, but also, you know, it comes from the world in which we live. It's a fallen world, you know, and this is a sin-filled world. And because we're living in this broken world, there's just things that happen. Life sometimes, you know, just uh, doesn't always hand us the best hand of cards. So, notice what Paul says. Hard times will come, but we rejoice in them. Now, we, we don't rejoice, rejoice for them, like, you know, excited because I get to suffer. And that's not, that's not what he means. 
But he's saying despite the hard times coming, we can still rejoice in the midst of that. You know, um, that we're not a victim of fate, you know, because we're the children of God. And even though we go through hard times, God is still with us. He's going to see us through it. He hasn't stopped caring for us because we have hard times. Yeah. I don't think I've ever rejoiced in suffering, but I've always understood that uh, I'm going to get through it. Yeah. You know, like the other day when I was tired of adulting, <laughs> I just, you know, I, was, I just knew I'd get through it. Right. You don't get happy about it. You just, you just push through it. Yeah. You know that God's going to help you. Yeah. You know that there's something, the light at the end of the tunnel. Um, yeah. yeah. Matthew. It says God, you know, puts us through trials to make us better and better and better. Yeah. And if you're not getting put through trials, God's not really caring about you. He's probably forgotten about mm -hmm. you. He's just yeah, they, you. they say that. The more trials you have, the more God loves you. <laughs> so if you feel like you're going through some hard times, well, you must be really loved by God. Well, if you quit thinking about God and keep Him all out of your life, sometimes you go through life and you don't get no more troubles. But mm -hmm. it doesn't mean you're yeah. going someplace good. Right, right. There's a lot of you know, people in the world who don't experience a lot of troubles. But yeah. Didn't they say something about, didn't the Bible say something about a father that doesn't discipline his children? Uh -huh. Yeah, well, and that's, but that's kind of a different thing, though. I mean, there's, there's, those kinds of troubles come um, because we're bad and God needs to correct us. But those are troubles, too. So we can put ourselves in, into trials when we're disobedient. And then he disciplines us, and we learn from them, and we grow from those, too. And, you know, we become more like him when we're disciplined, just like when a child grows and learns and all that. But then they're just, you know, they're just trials that it's not God trying to punish us or, or discipline us in any way. It's just because we live in a fallen world that things are going to happen. And But we can grow through those trials as well. And we can rejoice in those trials as well. <coughs> God is with us in those. So it's not always. And then persecution is another kind of trial where it's because the name we wear, Christian, that puts us in those trials specifically. So there's all kinds of different trials. But yeah, if if we're being disciplined by God, you know, it shows that we should, Paul was saying in that text, that we should see it as he's our loving father and he doesn't want us to be spoiled brats. So he's going to discipline us and correct us and help us to grow up. So yeah, so all the, all the kinds of different trials that we go through, uh, we should see with God's with us and he's helping us to grow and be better. So, yeah. So we can rejoice in those. And um, and then he goes on to say our, our sufferings, he says, produces perseverance. Or your translation might say endurance. But it's a picture word. And what it means is to stay, to stay under... Um, why you keep pressing toward the goal. You're under this pressure and you stay under it and keep going forward, keep doing what you've been doing. So, you know, the, the thing that we want to do is run. To get out of, underneath the pressure, get out underneath it and run away from it. But we don't like it. But what, but what perseverance means is you stay under it and you keep going. And so, and that's, perseverance is kind of one of the main, like if you had to sum up life in a couple, two or three words, I think perseverance would be one of those words. Because just, you keep on going, you keep on, because after you get through one trial, there's another one coming. So you just got to keep going. Keep on, so. keep on, keep on going, or something Keep on keeping on. Yeah, there you go. There. Keep on swimming. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so we just keep, uh, and Paul talks many times about kind of that life is like this race that we're on. It's like a race. You have to finish the race. You know, you don't want to quit. You just keep running. Eventually you get there. So, but it's like a marathon. It's not like a sprint race. <laughs> you keep going. 
Um, so staying under that pressure and, uh, you know, it's a choice of faith. And uh, so suffering will produce this endurance when we trust God in it. Um, and in the midst of it, there is that temptation. So we have to be able to push past the temptation of wanting the easy way out, you know, because uh, we have a tendency to want the easy way out. But just believe in God's sovereign grace in our lives that, that he's put us in a certain situation for a certain reason and he has a certain time frame for it. And then he says, endurance begins to work in us character. And this is the kind of word character that stood the test of the fire. So it's kind of a, a similar word to, you know, when we've talked about metal that goes through the furnace to be purified and the dross comes to the top and you skim off the dross and it purifies the metal. Well, this, this word for character is like that. It's not just the word character, it's more like tested character. Character that's been through the trials and the, and the, and the fire, you know. So it's kind of a, a veteran that's been through, through the fire already. And then lastly, he says, character produces hope. And so how does character produce hope? Well, Remember, he began with this word hope, so it's kind of like, almost like a full circle, cir circle here. You know, we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. But you know, once, you know, we have hope, I mean, we have hope even the first day that we're a Christian, come up out of the baptistry, we have hope, right? We have hope for this new life that we're in, this new future. But as we grow in our Christian life, our hope grows, doesn't it? It's, it's not the same kind of hope that was at the beginning. I mean, we had hope, but now we've been tested, we've been through the fire, we've gone through all kinds of trials, we've persevered, and so our hope is, is deeper, it's richer, you know? Where every day that we wake up, you know, in the beginning we didn't long so much for heaven, we were kind of more excited about this world. Now, as we get older, and we've been through more and more stuff, we're ready for heaven. <laughs> You know, so, you know, if you're at that part of it where it's like, I'm just ready to go to glory. So that hope of just, you know, getting through and you have a deeper sense of everything. So we've all experienced that kind of thing where we just, you know, we're ready. And the, the different trials that we go through, you know, most of us have been through some really, I mean, there's there's trials that are just, you know, they're hard, but then there's some trials that are just very, very difficult, you know, where your faith even just gets a little shaky. And there are trials where you learn the most from. And when you look back, you never want to go through that trial again, because you don't think you could, probably. But you also wouldn't want to erase it from your life because it's kind of what brought you to where you're at. You know what I mean? So it's, it was necessary for God to get you here. You know, so those trials are important. And so that's the kind of thing that he's talking about here. We have this deeper faith, this richer faith now. Um, and, you know, when we're going through suffering, you know, the, the people that we want to turn to, the people that we want to, to talk to and lean on, they're the people that have been through the fight already, right? When you need somebody to talk to, you want, you want to go to somebody that's been there, has been through it, and, and they've had, they have a positive outlook still, having gone through whatever they went through, you know, they still are singing, you know? Those are the kind of people we turn to. Yeah, Pam. Well, you know, it, it's not always a God that brings trials on us. The devil. Sure. Hurts. And mm -hmm. there's a different kind of a feeling that you wonder why when the devil's working, mm -hmm. you can kind of think of, it, well, I don't know how to explain it. Mm -hmm. But it's, seems like it's different whether it is different but also we have to remember even those kinds of trials god allows them because when you think about the story of job remember the devil gave job a lot of trials 
But he had to get God's permission first to do it. So I think that's with every trial we have, the devil has to get permission if you're going through something. So while it is from the devil, I think God also is allowing it because he knows it's going to be for your better good. So, but it's, it is different though. I know what you mean. Yeah. Yes, Marcy. I just went through a situation that uh, I don't know if anybody watching racing, car racing, and that was a big thing with my husband. Oh, yeah. And uh, uh, if anybody knows uh, Tony Stewart, that he uh, got hold of me last time, Tony Stewart, and he's one of my favorite race car drivers, huh? and I don't know him, and I do now. Mm -hmm. He uh, found out about Dell passing, and also about me having epilepsy. And so he uh, wrote me last time on Facebook, mm -hmm. and he wanted to know about my fever and preservation, and my kids not speaking to me. Well, we found this out. Don't ask me because I didn't speak to him. So he wanted a small letter from me, which I did. So he wrote me again this morning, and he told me, he said, "I'm going to keep in touch with you and you and me." He says, "Is there anything I can do to help you?" And I thought it's so strange because I don't know the man. I've never known him except to pass his. Fan mail around Facebook, uh -huh. and you that have Facebook, I'm sure know what that is. And he says, "You uh, write me any time, Marky, if you need help." When he found out I had no family, uh -huh. and I didn't know what to make of this because I never had anybody do this before, especially someone uh -huh. popular, you know, strange to me, and. Uh, so he did, and I felt strange, and I still do today, just like, and I wrote him back, and I said, you're the first person besides you people here at the church that's made me feel as though somebody cares, even those in the other church that I belong. And so it's just like, I don't know how to explain it. Well, God's probably using them to encourage you and help you through your mm -hmm. rough time. Yeah, and mm -hmm. so he just wrote me and told me, he says, mm -hmm. anytime you need me, you call. I don't care. Yeah. And it was strange. <coughs> I, yeah, I, think, I think God intersects our life, our lives with other people all the time to mm -hmm. help he us. He doesn't even know yeah. me. And so yeah. I just felt so strange today, just like something opened up. It's like God is in there. Yeah, right. I just feel strange and different today. Yeah. And that just happened last time. Good. And I don't even know the man. I'm glad. <laughs> so I just feel. I'm glad you got encouraged. Yeah. Matthew. Very much so. So I just wanted to share it with everyone. Yeah. So if you ever talk to him or I don't know what to do or not, please say a prayer for him. For okay. Me, please. Okay. What's his name? Tony Stewart. Okay. I mean, he did that on his own. Uh -huh. I didn't ask him or anything. How the man knew it, I'll, I'll never know. But yeah. I'll, I'll think an awful lot of him for that. <clears throat> Matthew? I was just going to say, I believe God used Job as an example. He was even proud of Job talking to Satan. Uh -huh. That's why I say, well, why don't you test him in this? And he goes, go ahead. Yeah. But I'm pretty sure that you know, when my life is destroyed, that's the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. yeah. It always makes you feel better because even though Job was so loved, he still got you know, slammed. Mm -hmm. God took everything away, but didn't give him that life. Mm -hmm. Kind of like you can go to heaven. You might get slammed, but you'll get it all back. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because everybody just gets scared. Yeah, I think it's a very important book that I'm by this because I know I spend 
We went through a really, really tough time in building this one one week. <laughs> and a lot of his prayers, too, a lot of things he says when he's going through it, you know, it's kind of things you're feeling, but things you wouldn't even dare to pray to God, but it's, you know, Job kind of says them all for you, so it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's comforting to know that he went through it. So, let's see, where were we? So, suffering it produces endurance, endurance produces character, character produces hope, and, um, you know, we're part of the reason we're here together as a body of Christ, that we come together is to encourage one another, and when somebody's been through a trial, they are able to help somebody else that's just beginning their trial. And so we're here to encourage one another. We've all been through stuff, and maybe not exactly the same kind of things, but, you know, the Lord wants us to encourage one another and help each other when we go through those types of things. So what does, what does Paul want us to understand? Uh, he said, you know, we began with hope, we rejoice in the hope of God, and then all of a sudden the hard times come. And uh, what do hard times do? Well, do they destroy your hope? No, because if you put those situations in God's hands, they will deepen and strengthen the hope that you have. Um, and that kind of uh, fire-tested hope, it won't disappoint us. You know, it won't put us to shame because um, we see God act. We see God working in that situation. And then when you go through the next trial, you know, then we can look back on the trial that we've previously been through. And we know that God will be there for us this time because he was with us last time. And so it's supposed to help us, encourage us to to be able to do it. But I know sometimes I've had great faith in one trial, and other times when I go through a trial, I don't have the faith that I did the last time. And I don't know why that is, but... <laughs> but, you know, sometimes we don't always respond to our trials the way we ought to. But God even still loves us and works through us, works with us in those situations as well. Verse 5 says, and hope does not disappoint us because God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom he has given us. So the Holy Spirit is that indwelling insurance, you know. He is the part of the Trinity that is with us every step of the way and helps us understand what, what God is trying to teach us. He helps us to interpret the word of God. He encourages us and comforts us. He's, one of the words is he comes alongside us. So it's like he's walking with us. And he's our conscience, you know. But it's this love is lavished on us. And the way it's lavished on us is through his Holy Spirit. He's given us his spirit. So the, God's love for us is shown at the cross. Uh, but God's love in us is revealed through his, his Spirit. So, you know, the Christian life, it's not just this external encounter, you know, that we have with just the facts about the Bible, but it's also this internal experience. It's a relationship that we have mm -hmm. with God. And uh, so that's what makes the difference. There's, there, there's people that have kind of an outward relationship they read their Bible, they know the facts, but they haven't come to this place where they have, you know, this relationship with, with God. So, that's how we know we can get through the tough times, you know, when we are experiencing this relationship, asking for his help through it all, and not pushing him away. A lot of times when people go through trials, they push God out of the way, or they don't speak to him because they're angry with him or whatever. But that's the time we need to be most, you know. When we're going through the trial, we need to be praying more than we ever have and, and utilizing the Spirit instead of grieving the Spirit. In verse 8, Paul says, But God demonstrated his own love for us in this, that while we are still sinners, Christ died for us. 
He died for sinners. And we've talked about this before, but behind the word sinner is, um, in the Greek language, is this idea of an archer who misses the target, you know, falling short of the target. And he's saying that's who we are. We are sinners. We are like sheep who've gone astray. We've turned to our own way. We are um, wayward people. And um, the Bible compares us with sheep all the time. And uh, sheep are just always going astray. You know? And so we never hit the target. We, we never hit the target of God's, God's will. God's purpose um, and that's true for all of us so that's why God had to, to die for us because we were away with them the end of verse 6 he uses an even stronger word to describe what we are apart from Christ he says that Christ died not only for wayward people but he died for rebellious the ungodly and this word ungodly it's a, it's a strong word it's kind of like the word un-American you know, if you say something is un-American, um, it's not just to say that it's not American, right? It's to say that it goes against what America stands for, right? And so to say that someone is ungodly is to say that we are in rebellion against God. You know, it's, it's not that just we're neutral, or we're apathetic about God, we're actually against what God stands for. That's the term that Paul used that we were before we became Christians. We were, and then later he'll say we were even his enemies. <coughs> so there's different terms, but they all kind of, we're talking about the, the same kind of thing. We were doing our own thing, we were going wayward, but we were also ungodly. <coughs> And that was true about all of us. I mean, it might have been not such an outward rebellion. Like, you know, there's different people that experience different types of rebellion. You know, you had the, you know, like the story of the prodigal son. You know, you had the son that went away and spent all his money on prostitutes and drinking and all that. And that was kind of an outward expression of his rebellion, right? But then you had the son that stayed at home and he was rebellious too. He was still, you know, there at his father's house doing all his duties, but his heart was hard. And he was rebellious against his father because, you know, he didn't have love. For one, he didn't have love for his brother coming back. And they were both prodigal sons. So there's some of us, you know, we were rebellious, more like the son at home. We didn't really, you know, do all these terrible things that everybody does. And then some of us were, but we've all had a rebellious heart, and it doesn't matter how it was expressed. Paul is saying we were all ungodly, we were all rebellious, we were all spiritually wayward. And another thing he points out here in verse 6 is that Christ died uh, for the spiritually powerless. So we were spiritually helpless, powerless. You know, we didn't have the resources in ourselves to change our situation, right? Um, we had good intentions, maybe, but we always fell short. We couldn't do it on our own. You know, and um, if you get your theology from Benjamin Frank Franklin, you're going to be in trouble because Benjamin Franklin is the one that came up with the phrase, God helps those who help themselves. <laughs> But God doesn't help those who help themselves. God helps the helpless. That's what it says here. God helps the helpless. The powerless. So, and that's hard for people to, to really grab a hold of. Because, you know, they think that um, they just keep trying harder. Work more diligently and determined. But it doesn't matter how hard we work, how determined we are. We're not going to be able to change our status before God. Only Jesus is going to be able to do that. And, and Paul's kind of writing from his own experience because this is kind of the theology he had before he met Christ. You know, when there was the Pharisees and the Pharisees and he made a long list of all his achievements. You know, he thought he could just do it by doing all the, the great works that he could do and 
just intensely religious, but he still fell short. And when he met Jesus, he realized that. And that's how we all are, you know. So God, God's love reaches out to anybody that will receive it, but we all fall short, so we all need it, and we all need to receive it. So we'll stop there. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your word, and we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for all that he's done for us. We thank you that he has saved us when we were helpless, when we were powerless, when we were rebellious, when we were ungodly. You came to our rescue, and uh, you made us righteous because of Christ's righteousness. We thank you for all that he did on the cross to save us. And we thank you for this free gift of eternal life that you have offered to us. And um, we thank you that you have many promises, like being able to share in your glory. And that we will not only be able to see your glory, but share in it. And all the wonderful things, and we can't even really, we can try to imagine them, but we'll never really understand them until we get to heaven. But we know that they're going to be greater than we could ever imagine. So thank you for all those things. Thank you for how much you love us. Help us to go out and speak and do what we ought to do. And follow your word and listen to your spirit who guides us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.